My name is Marc Grégoire. I'm a software architect from Belgium. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, working for Nikon, and this is Ankit. Yeah, this is Ankit. I'm a program manager for Microsoft. I work on the Visual C++ team as well. And I guess we will be talking about cross-platform C++ today. Um, hopefully you guys at the back can hear me fine. If you guys can, just raise a hand. Anyone in the back, perfect. So actually, let's get started. Okay. Mark. So mobile devices. Everyone these days has mobile devices. Um, everyone has at least a smartphone, maybe a tablet, maybe a smartwatch. A lot of people have multiple mobile device, devices. And what customers want to do is they want to run their favorite apps on all of their devices. So if they have one app, they want to be able to run it on their Windows smartphone, they want to run it on their iPad, on their Android devices. They just want to have one app. And mobile developers, they also want to target as many platforms as possible because by doing that you reach a much bigger market share and of course this can bring in more money for the developer. However, um, developers are reluctant to support uh, multiple platforms if that means that it's a lot of extra work to do or if it's too hard to port one application to a, a different platform. So we have to do something about that. This slide is a survey done by Mobile uh, Vision um, for Microsoft. So it was a survey of 8,000 mobile app developers. And here you, you can clearly see that the biggest platform is Android followed by an iOS followed by Windows. But you also see that quite a few developers are targeting multiple platforms. So you see that in total 37% are targeting Android and iOS. But you can also see that only 11% is targeting all three platforms. Because at, at this moment, it's too hard to, to support all of them. It's too much work. So just, so sorry, just curious here, like how many people have actually written a mobile app here? Just a raise of hands. How many people have actually written an app for Android or iOS? Perfect, that's a great crowd. So do you guys agree with this slide here? Or roughly agree with this slide here, anyone? The Windows bubble is a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 8%. Yeah. How Sorry, many people yeah. developed an app for all three of them? That's Perfect. Not, well, that's not so much. <laughs> um, the survey also showed that on average, game developers, they develop for 2.6 platforms and non-game developers only for 2.2 platforms. So I think that probably has to do with the fact that if you develop a non-game app, then you have to make sure that the UI is platform specific, while if you make a game, it can look exactly the same on all three platforms, so it's a little bit less work. So how do we want to support multiple platforms? There are two ways to do this. We have the silo approach, and we have the cross-platform approach. The silo approach is what I guess a lot of people are using today. That means that on Windows you use C Sharp or C++ CX for just a second. This is starting to make a lot of noise. So on Windows you use C Sharp or C++ CX and you use XAML for the UI. On iOS um, you use Objective-C or Swift on Android, you use Java. And what's the benefit of this? Well, on each of the different platforms, you have the full native experience. You're using the, the main language of each platform. And you have total access to the entire device as, as long as it has been exported by the SDK. And if the SDK, if a new version of the SDK releases a new feature for your platform, you can immediately use it because you're directly working on that SDK. There are quite a few downsides to this approach. First one is code reuse. It's very hard to reuse code because on Windows, you're writing your code in C Sharp or C++. Apple, it's Objective-C, Android, it's Java, so it's very hard to, to share the code. Um, it also costs more to develop all three platforms. If you implement a new feature for one of the platforms, you have to implement, the, actually you have to implement three times in three different languages. 
And then there is this thing that one platform can become a dominant platform. And that means if, if you develop a new application or a new game, you might release it for the three different platforms at once. Then after a while, you might notice that one of the platforms brings in more revenue. So you will start focusing on that one platform. If you add new features, you will first implement it in that, for that platform. And then later you might or might not port that feature to the other platforms. And so one platform will get all the new goodies and the other platforms are going down and down in, in the feature set. So this is the silo approach. The other approach is to use a cro cross-platform tool or, or platform. And there are quite a few of them. I uh, don't know if you can read that in the back. But you have things like Cordova, Samarin, Unity, Qt. Those are all well-known um, tools that allow you to develop cross-platform applications and games. This is a survey also done by Vision Mobile. Um, and the blue bars, they show the usage of that specific tool in 2012. The orange bars, bars uh, show the usage in 2015. So you see that there is a lot of interest in developing applications for multiple platforms at the same time. It's increasing. Just curious again, like how many people have here used Cordova, Unity, or Xamarin running a mobile app? Okay, a fair bunch. But it seems like Unity is only designed for game developers. Uh, I, I, it looks like Xamarin has increased, but it hasn't increased that much. It seems like uh, OneGap seems like it has done the biggest jump. Is there any yeah. reason why? Uh, other than Mindshare, I mean, uh, Unity, you're absolutely right. It's 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 just for for games, right? But Cordova, from the survey that we did, uh, basically, it seemed like Mindshare perspective was is a major winner there. Okay. Now I don't know the answer why, but uh, but I think like it could be that the survey is struggling more web developers per se or or not. Uh, oh, uh, it looks like Qt just uh, was. Did Qt actually just uh, was released, or was, was because it seems like there's nothing that was. Um, before 2012 or so. We didn't have data for the survey, both for Qt and Marmalade. And Qt and Marmalade are both C++ based uh, SDKs. Okay, so, so basically it's possible that there wasn't anything for both. Could be. So what's the benefit of using a cross-platform tool like this? Um, you have support for a wide range of platforms. But more importantly, once you know how to use that cross-platform tool, and the cross-platform tool start uh, at support for a new platform, then you don't need to learn anything new. Your current applications that are written for that in that tool will immediately work on a new platform. But of course, again, a couple of downsides. There is no fast iteration. For example, if Android releases a new API level, then you have to wait until the cross-platform tool supports that API level before you can use it. <coughs> There is no native look and feel. These, these um, cross-platform tools, they will provide some kind of UI, but it will probably not look native. And there is a runtime performed because you're running on top of, of this, this cross-platform tool, so that might incur some runtime penalty. So if you look closely at the three different platforms, there is actually a common denominator, but let's first have a trivia question. So if you look at the top 100 uh, Android Play Store applications on the US Android Play Store, how many of these are using C++? So I have a couple of options. So who thinks none of these 100 top applications use C++? No one? How many think 15% use C++? A few of them. How many think 40%? 75%? Yeah, ah, that's the a good majority. <laughs> yeah, but it's, but it's 75%. Um, here is a list of these top 100 Android Play Store applications. Um, all of the pink ones, they use C++ in some way or another. So they might use a little bit of C++ or a lot of C++, but they do use C++. So these things, the, this list includes applications such as Facebook, Twitter, um, Candy Crush, Temple Run, and so on. So really, 
big, big apps or games. So it's C++ is the common de denominator. You can use it on all three platforms. You can use it on Windows, you can use it on iOS, you can use it on Android. And by using C++, what are the benefits? You still have the full native experience like you do if you would develop in the um, platform-specific language like C Sharp, C++, CX, and so on. And you still have total access to the device as long as the SDK allows it. But there are lots of extra benefits by switching to C++. The first one is code reuse. So you, you might have a lot of old code lying around that is written in C++. You can directly use it. If you write a new feature, you write it in C++ and you can use it on all three platforms. But there is also a lot of third party C++ libraries out there. For example, the Unreal Engine or EA Frostbite Engine. They are both mainly written in C++, so you can immediately use these in, on the three platforms. Performance. C++, as everyone knows, runs natively on the hardware. There is no virtual machine in there like .NET or Java, so it runs faster. And this is also important for battery life. It's mobile devices, the important factor there is battery life. Everyone has to charge their smartphone probably every day. And we want to extend that. If you write your apps first in C++, it means they are more performant, so they get the job done quicker, they use less battery, and your device lasts longer. Last one is security. If you compile your application C++, it's much harder to de decompile it um, and um, try to get your IP out of it. Well, it's, it's easier to do this in, in .NET or C Sharp. Uh, .NET or Java. So next, let's take a look at how a C++ um, mobile application looks like. This, this could be the architecture. You, so you have a big shared C++ backend. You try to make this as big as possible. And then on top of that, you have a thin UI layer. In the UI layer in Windows, that would be XAML and C Sharp or XAML and C++ CX. On Android, you would use XML and Java for your UI layer. And on iPhone, you can use Cocoa Touch. And these thin UI layers, they are connected with the shared C++ backend through uh, PMVoke for C Sharp, um, GNA, GNI, Java Native Interface wrappers on Java, and Object C wrappers for iOS. Um, when the, you also said that uh, there's also C++ wrappers uh, on the Windows side. Um, couldn't that also be used uh, indirectly through the C++ CX or C Sharp? And I think C++ CX is based on the old uh, C++ CLI uh, uh, programming model that I think uh, um, is kind of gone now, or? Yeah, there are actually two different things, C++ CLI and, and C++ mm -hmm. CX. C++ is, is CX is a new one. It's entirely based on COM. It's, it's actually nothing to do with the, the old version. Um, it's completely native, while C++ CLI is still running on, on .NET. Right. So no, but but it, what it, but it was actually based on the old C++ CLI, except that they got rid of garbage collection. Everything is reference count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's correct. What's the question exactly? <laughs> I uh, was basically saying that uh, I was basically asking, isn't the C Sharp or C++ wrappers actually just kind of providing a little bit of a common interface into the .NET framework or the C Sharp uh, framework, uh, so that way it can utilize the uh, XAML in interface on the top? I mean, are you talking about the left column in RT stuff? Those are just specific uh, Windows APIs that we're trying to access. Okay. Uh, we can take this offline. Uh, yeah. We have a lot sorry, of slides. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Just... No, no problem. No worries. There <laughs> are any, any other questions? Don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, so this shared C++ backend, of course, it has to be compiled somehow and then consumed. On, on Windows, you would compile it to a dynamic um, library, DLL, or to a static library, a lib file. On Android, you would compile it to a .so or a .a file. And on, on 
iOS, you compile it to, an, to a .a file. And this architecture is used by quite a few applications. Some of them are, are listed here, so you have Microsoft Office. Um, most of the applications in the Office suite are at least sharing 90% of the code base. It's all written in, in standard C++. And if I'm not mistaken, PowerPoint, for example, uses more than 95 or 98 percent is shared C++ code. So with a very thin UI layer on top of it. Then you have Bing and Skype, Dropbox, Facebook Moments. They are all using a similar architecture. Excuse me? <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, which tools do you use if you want to go this, this way? So if you develop for Windows, you have to install the Visual C++ compiler, Visual Studio, IDE. You will use MS Build and Make for your build engine. You have to use Windows 8, 8.1, or Windows 10. For Android, you, can, you have to install GCC or Clang. You have to install the NDK build system. Make you use make files, Gradle, and you can use, there are several IDEs available. One of them is Eclipse. You can develop on Mac OS, Linux, or Windows. For Apple, for Apple, you have to develop on Mac OS. You have to use Xcode, Xcode, Xcode build system, and that one uses a Clang LLVM. So there is quite a problem with this. You have to install a lot of IDEs, a lot of build systems, so, yeah, that's what this slide is about. You have multiple ex installations. You have to install a lot of stuff manually. You have to learn at least three IDEs or more. Um, and if you have a build server, and I guess every company has a build server, if you want to target the three platforms, you will have to maintain and set up three different build servers with three different um, build engines and so on. Debugging experience is also not perfect, could be better, because you have to use the right tool chain to, to start debugging a problem. Handling crashes, crash dumps, and so on, it's, it's all different for every single platform. So what do we want? We would like to have one installer. You just download it, you click next, 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 finished. It should be easy to install, it should install everything what you want. Um, it should be one single IDE, which you can use for all the platforms that you want to support. Um, it has to be easy to write and share code and reuse that, that code. Um, and we want emulation support so that we don't always have to have the, the physical hardware, so you can just emulate it on, on one machine. So that's what we want in a, in a nice cross-platform mobile solution. So with that, I'll leave it to Ankit to, to um, speak more in detail about Visual C++ and to give some hands-on demos with, with, uh, with Visual C++ 2050. Thanks, Mark. Um, so far, is there any questions that you guys have? Sorry. <coughs> any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I noticed this is mobile development, mm -hmm. but can't you also, uh, is there any way you can extend this, these tool sets to develop, develop like uh, server platforms, uh, for example, if you wanted to create a small server application that would run on Windows, run on, on uh, Linux, run on uh, Mac OS, um, you, I mean. You could use the same tool set. Uh, I mean, the tool set that we added, I think on the slide that Mark was talking about, uh, these tool sets right here, these are, for example, let's take the Apple Clang LVM toolchain. You can also use the same toolchain to create a Mac application. But we, I mean, you know, you're absolutely right about that. But we're going to talk about what Visual Studio does, and uh, we currently don't support targeting Mac as of now. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So basically, you can't like write a application that would be Linux based or uh, go on a Windows server machine. Uh, Our out of the box templates don't allow that. Uh, okay. If you meet me after this talk, we will show you how you can do some of this stuff. Is there any other questions at the back here? Here, no, perfect, okay. So uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Visual C++ now. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction. Um, so how many people actually have tried out Visual Studio 2015? 
very good people. Colin, you don't count. <laughs> 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 but I like, the, I like the enthusiasm. Okay, how many people are actually aware that Visual Studio 2015 allows you to do mobile development? Wow, you guys have already uh, tried this out. What platforms have you guys tried this out for? Anyone wants to? Yes, sir. Uh, mainly Android, but also Win32. I see. It's, it's, at, least, it's a, at least with Visual Studio. How's your experience so far? Perfect, okay, so we should always talk, anyone who's actually already tried this product and has feedback for us, we would love to talk to you in more detail. Um, I'm gonna actually give someone else a chance if anyone else has a question at this point. Yes, right at the back. Yeah, that's not a question, a comment. The Visual Studio basically the only way to efficiently debug C++ code in Android. I will shake your hand at this point. But Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it perfect. And this is, did not come from me, but I'm going to talk about it now. <laughs> so, yes. I uh, just wanted to, uh, basically, I'm, I haven't run it uh, recently, but I had done some uh, test development on the earlier versions of uh, Visual Studios. I think release can RC right. a candidate. And on my computer, every time I kind of shut down the, uh, shut down the emulator, it would just crash my system. Well, wait till RTM. Well, RTM is already out. You should try that out. Yeah, I, I haven't done that yet. So, I, I mean, I, I, I'm talking of, yeah, I mean. Of course, we fixed all these problems in RTM. <laughs> <laughs> let's go over the presentation. Yes, let's just go over this. So, okay. basically, 2015 RTM is out. It's been out there for a couple of months now. And uh, essentially, these are the perks that we provide. Uh, we provide you an easy installation experience. You can download all your tools that you need for doing Windows development, Android development, iOS development uh, through our installer now. We also install all the third-party stuff like the Android SDK, the NDK, and you name it, we have it in there. As a matter of fact, for some time we were also installing Google Chrome, where some customers told us, have you guys signed a deal with Google? But then we took it out. But essentially all the tools are there that you guys need for doing cross-platform stuff. Uh, the vision for Visual Studio is to become that once one IDE that does uh, cross-platform mobile development across uh, for iOS, Android, and Windows. Um, and that's basically what we've been following. Um, our, some of our extra features or the limelight features that we have is that we allow you to some clever project structures, which we're going to demo soon. They allow you to share code across multiple platforms, Android, iOS, Windows, and you'll see that. And then the last one there is basically debugging. Debugging has been uh, a main power play for Visual Studio for years. Uh, we've been doing and do that for Windows developers for some time now. We're going to do the exact same thing for Android and iOS as well. So that's what's in there, along with a fast emulator that you guys can also try out for the Android platform again. So that's what we have in the product. Now, I'm going to go into demos, but before I actually even go there, I want to ask you this question. Um, how many people actually have tried the iOS development experience through Visual Studio? No brave souls there. Oh, there is one brave soul in the back. I see, perfect. So essentially the first demo that I have here is a native activity application. Um, Android uh, with API level nine, I believe, allowed, allowed an app that can actually be completely C++. And I'm just gonna show you some of the perks there. And I'm gonna demo the, uh, the, some of the features that you see here on the list, the Eclipse Converter, how to build this app. We have parallel compilation now. Uh, Clang GCC toolchain support, some core editing features, native debugger, lock ad viewer, and so on. So let's get into the first demo here. So I'm gonna to try to find my uh, app here. Oops, oh, you guys don't see that. No, I don't see that, hang on. <laughs> Let me just uh, fix this, uh, duplicate, it's always easier. Here we go, perfect. So the first thing I wanna show you guys uh, um, this is not important, whatever, what was there, is that we actually have a converter. Uh, so does anybody use Eclipse still for Android? There's a few hands there. So if you're actually working in Eclipse, uh, you know, initially Eclipse was more popular for C++ development for Android. So we actually have a pretty nice converter. All you gotta do is you basically go and add your project that you're working on in Eclipse. So in this case, uh, I can actually choose the Android manifest.xml, and when I click finish, that will essentially convert your Eclipse project into a Visual Studio project. So this is something really new that we shipped about a couple of months back uh, for people who are still in Eclipse can try this out. Uh, how many people here are using Android Studio? The rest of the bunch, perfect. So we're still working on something for that. 
so the, the first app that I'll bring up here is basically an app that I just converted, uh, you know, using the converter for, for Eclipse, from, uh, from Eclipse to VS. And what this app is, is really, it's just a C++ app, it's OpenGL3, and it has some crude graphics. So while I do that, I want to show you some of the features that we have. I'll bring up the property pages here for that. You'll see that, uh, you know, in the platform tool set, we allow Clang and GCC. And you can also, you know, if you're, if you're smart, if, if you're actually looking at some of the other additional options here, you can also choose some of the other tool chains. There's a way to do that uh, if it's in the NDK. Uh, you can specify which uh, API level you're targeting. In this case, you're targeting API level 19, but you can target pretty much any API level. You can build dynamic shared libraries, you can build static libraries, and so on. The other thing here that we've done uh, the work for is the fact that we've actually updated all our property pages to reflect Clang and LLVM properties. So for example, if you're targeting x86, you can actually build this for, for Neon instructions or the SIMD instructions we're building for x86 and Neon for, for ARM. And you can just do that via, via just you know using these property pages and so on. Same way for the linker, we pretty much have all the property pages here for how to define your dependencies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can also choose the Google Goal linker, which is about 20% faster than the standard LD linker when you're building stuff. So you can choose that as part of the workflow as well, um, and, and so on. So let's talk about yes, sir. Native Windows? Yes, using no. Clang and... Uh, no. No? Okay. There was, a, there was a talk earlier that happened, I believe, uh, and a couple of hours ago. Okay. And they actually talked about how to build a Windows app using Clang C2, yes. or at least the common code using Clang C2. Um, you should take a look at that. And we can always chat offline. So what is this project, really? It's, uh, it's, it's very simple. It's uh, all the C++ code is in this native activity project. So you can see all the C, C code here. And it's mixed with C++ code here. The packaging project here, uh, what that does is that it takes the C++ code, which is being built as a dynamic shared library, or an SL file, which is like a DLL on the Windows platform, and then it gets packaged into an APK. So currently, uh, you know, this is a Java code that's there, and here's your assets for this particular application, shaders, and so on. And, you know, we actually use Ant right now to build this, and this will eventually build the APK that you guys need to debug and deploy. So that's currently our current workflow. We're working on adding Gradle support and some of Java language server support and all that kind of stuff. So you should see that happening fairly soon. Uh, I think we're about a couple months out. So if you guys want to try this out beforehand, it goes to public. Please be our guest. Uh, you can sign up with me after this talk. So let's keep going here. So let me show you some code here. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring up this function called Android main. On a good day, this works. Today is not my good day, so I'll bring up native activity. Something is wrong. Here we go. I'm sure why did not work. Ah, I was missing the underscore. Who actually here knows what Android main is? Does anyone in the crowd know what this function is? It's a very characteristic Android function. And don't cheat the comment before it says exactly what that does. Interesting. Uh -huh, see. Is, is that kind of like the main function that kind of uh, uh, says that this is actually uh, giving the, uh, or this is the actual initialization, just like the, how C, you, you have the main function in C++. Yes, you're absolutely right. So it's, it's almost like a int main function. So when you're writing a C++ native activity app uh, for Android, uh, this is a very characteristic function. This is the entry point function that comes up. <laughs> uh, very popular talk. <laughs> so the, the next thing I want to show you guys is some of the language services experience here. So this is the Android main function, and I'm going to go ahead and add some of the uh, Android lock print message. As I'm actually bringing up, this, this up, you can see that we actually have added support for Android uh, specific intelligence. And uh, you, know, you can actually leverage this uh, and so on when you're writing code. All the other language service features that you use to today on the Windows platform work as well. So for example, let's pick up source is an interesting one. You can actually do things like you know, peak definition, so you'll see where, where, the, where the definition is coming from. You can actually do go to definition, F12, which will also work for you and all that kind of stuff. So you can pretty much take the Windows experience that you have today working on Visual Studio and now actually make that work for Android as well. So the advanced features now, you know, like refactoring also work. Uh, so let me demo that. Obviously, this is not a very good parameter type, so I'm actually going to go ahead and change this. So you can see here, I can actually do this by using the refactoring feature that we added recently. Uh, clicking rename here allows me to change this parameter type. I'm going to make this a good engine, good demo, because 
you know, that obviously makes it a lot better. Uh, clicking preview allows me to actually see all the occurrences of this particular type and I can actually go through the list here and choose which one I like um, and so on and which one I want to replace and which one I don't want to replace. I'm going to just go to click apply and magically you'll see that, you know, that already happened that for you. Now you won't find that in many IDs, let me tell you that. Now next, uh, next I want to show you the debugging experience as the gentleman at the back mentioned. Uh, we have a fairly good debugging experience here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to decorate this with a few, few breakpoints here. Uh, and I'm actually going to hit F5. Hitting F5 or the play button there uh, will actually build the application as well. So I'm going to remove this because I want to just want to mention something here for a second. So notice how the debugger dropdown is already populated with the VS emulator entry. This is the fast uh, Microsoft emulator. It's Hyper-V based. It's an Android emulator. Uh, it's not that bad. You guys should try it out. It's really good actually. And since this, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. What if you had a touch screen that you wanted to kind of play around with it? Uh, can, is there any way you can enable that touch screen to work on the en emulator? Is that, that only it, for mouse based uh, systems? No, it actually works for touch as well. Now they don't give us that kind of fancy equipment to demo, but it does work for touch. You have to take my word for it. Because I've tried that and I have not been able to use touch screen on. So if you hit that button there, multi-touch input, it will actually work for you. I'll demo that in a second. Okay. So if I can go back. So I'm just going to hit F5 here. F5 is going to build this and then try to deploy this. So you can see as it's building, uh, we've done the work to actually integrate all the errors that come up in the output window to come as a part of the errors and warnings window. So if you click there, you can go all to the source line and all that kind of good stuff. So you'll see here that uh, our deploy cycle is something that we really worked hard at. Our debugger currently uses the GDB server mechanism, which is the same as the Android debuggers that are out there. But we've worked really hard in making the, you know, the debugger workflow really, really fast because that's what you guys do a lot of the time. So you'll see here the, you know, the breakpoint that I hit, uh, you know, the breakpoint that I set gets hit. You can pretty much do anything you can do on Windows today on this, uh, in this world as well. So you can actually look at autos. It's really fast. I know this is actually a fairly simple, uh, simple app. But you can see here the locals window, the watch window, all that kind of stuff will just magically work for you. Also, you can look at the call stack. You can look at breakpoints that you set, exception settings. We even give you a command line window so you can actually, you know, if you want to go here and do GDB exec, you can actually pass commands to GDB itself if you want to do that, um, and so on. So you can kind of like use the debugging experience really nice. The other thing I want to mention here is the Lockcat window. So, I mean, anyone who's actually done any development on Android would know that Lockcat is actually a time saver and it actually logs uh, system events. Uh, so you can actually see here, uh, I actually had an Android log print message already. Actually, it's going to happen next, so that's good. So I'm going to hit continue here. In the meantime, now where did my Lockcat window go? Now, let's bring it back up. So if you get lost, it's right here. So you'll see here that... Uh, uh, where did my, so this is actually a log message that I just added, so that's coming up from my application right here. So that's actually coming from right here. So you can see here that we have a fully integrated experience that you guys can use uh, with the Lockhead window, the debugger, and so on. So, yes, sir? You can use it with an actual device. Absolutely, you can. Uh, now again, I would say this again. I like saying this again and again. Uh, we don't actually have the equipment to do Wolf Vision and show the app running. That's the only reason I'm not doing that here. But you can run this on ARM32 devices, x86 devices, x64 devices, ARM64 devices. Did I miss a platform? I didn't, right? Thanks. So you can pretty much run on any of these platforms. Yes, sir? Being a little optimistic, uh, could you actually debug if you need, like, Java or If you talk to me after this uh, session, uh, we can set you up on a preview program. We actually are working on that really, really hard. And soon you'll see something happen uh, for that experience as well. So about a month and a half, month and a half, two months away. So none of this is available now? No, all this is available. Oh, this Just is a Java experience is not available. Okay. Java Objective-C experience. Actually, you can actually debug Objective-C code. We don't have full debugging support yet for Objective-C. You can do some minimal debugging there. But for Java, it's, it's coming soon. Uh, there's already a plugin there on VS Gallery that we shipped uh, that allows you to do Java language services and Java debugger. But the Java debugger there is for standard Java applications, uh, Java SC, not Java for Android. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. So, are you working on the ability to build uh, iOS objective here? Oh, yeah. You'll see that in the demo. Yeah. Any other questions there? Yes, sir. Uh, doesn't Apple try to enforce that you all use Apple machines for iOS development? Right. Uh, you're, abs you're absolutely right. Uh, by law or by Apple legality, 
uh, we have to build the app uh, on the uh, Mac platform. And you'll see a Mac there. So what we do is that we have a remote agent that runs on the Mac. And it makes you look like you never have to leave Visual Studio. It does all the work for you on the Mac. And we'll demo that. So we'll come back to that. Yes, sir? I've, had, I've, I've used like some of the Android stuff a bit, and I've had trouble like getting questions, like technical questions, found and answered. Stack Overflow doesn't seem to have a lot on it mm -hmm. yet. Uh, the MSDN forums, uh, they have a Visual C section, and they're very window specific to the point that if I ask an Android question, I either get nothing back or I get someone saying, "This is usually like a Windows forum." Uh, and maybe I missed some, maybe I missed like a particular subsection of like. I am extremely sad to hear that. Uh, um, we will, if you look at the slide deck at the end, there is a section where you can actually reach us, uh, reach out to us. Okay. Uh, we are dying to work hand, hand, hand with every single one of you guys there. Uh, so, and I think uh, we have Colin here as well, who's from our documentation team and forums team. So, uh, let's talk after this to make sure that we have a channel there for you guys. We've been crawling Stack Overflow to answer questions. Maybe your caller is not looking for the right stuff. So let's, so let's definitely talk. Uh, are there any, any, any other questions here before I go on? So. Uh, excuse me. I was wondering about the Android blog print. Does that, does that actually print into the Android machine, or is that just only? It's just to, diagnostic. OK, so it doesn't print. So it's technically just like an invisible call. Pretty much, as far as I know. So you can see here the app running, and people, I think, can correct me if I'm wrong. So that's actually the app running. You can see it's running OpenGL3, so our emulator supports OpenGL3. You can, the emulator also supports multi-touch. So what you can do is if you have a touch screen, I don't have a touch screen here, but if you have a touch screen, you can actually use your fingers to do zoom in and zoom out and all that kind of cool stuff. Um, also, we do other kinds of crazy stuff, so you can actually rotate the app. Uh, you can you know, do all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're also... Uh, can you do partial rotation? Partial rotation. I don't know yeah, how to do that. I'm saying yeah, like... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just saying like instead yeah. of doing it 90 and it's uh, 180, you just push it at like 35 degrees or something like we that. Don't, right we don't have that right now. The, the other thing we can do though is we have all these sensors here. So we have an accelerometer, a location sensor, a network sensor, a battery sensor. So you guys can pretty much use that, uh, you know, when you want to simulate some of the conditions which are hard to do in a real device, you can leverage the, uh, leverage the emulator for that. We're also working on supporting some of the other sensors that are there and so on. So if you guys have any ideas or feedback, please, by all means, let us know. At the back of the room, sir. Uh, you said it's GLS3, but is that new? Or? I remember letting this go on to the... Can you... Yeah, we've been working on adding more and more API supports. The way that our, our, our installer works is that uh, if you actually install the product today, we update the live bits. That, so these are all now compartmentalized into Visual Studio plugins. These are all plugins, by the way, the Android story, the iOS story, the emulator. So if you go install the product today, you'll pretty much get the latest version with all the new features. So, so it automatically takes care of that. So if you try that out, you'll see more features there, bug fixes there, and so on. So that's pretty much the first demo that I wanted to show you guys. So I'm hoping you guys can try this at home or, oh, no, it doesn't work, does it? So pretty much I assure you all that kind of stuff. So is there any questions or please, by all means, after the, after the meeting, uh, we can get into that. After the session, we can get into that. The second app I want to show you guys here is an OpenCV app. Uh, now OpenCV is a pretty popular image uh, graphics library. And we want to show you something real uh, happening there in, in that world. Um, and again, this is going to be another uh, Android application, but it also has a Windows component. So let's take a look at that. Um, so how many people here are familiar with universal style apps or anybody here actually that's built that? One person, two, two people there, okay. So let's talk about this for a second. So I, I mentioned that one of our USPs, uh, you know, that we're saying in Visual Studio is that we want the one IDE for targeting all platforms. If you take a look at the solution and you take a look at the image filters library folder here, it has two projects here. It's, it's got an Android targeting story, Android project, and it's got a UAP project here. And then we have a shared component. So what's really happening here is that all this code that you're seeing here is shared code between the Android world and the UAP world. Now, if you take a look at the Android property pages, in this case, uh, we're building a static library, which is consuming you know, the, the shared component right here and the Android specific source files. 
And likewise, if you look at the UAP source code here, it has UAP specific source here, and then it has all the shared component source here as well. So what we're trying to demo here is that you can use this kind of a project structure pretty easily to be able to uh, share your cross-platform code and use that, use one ID for being able to do that. Now, if I want to build for any of these platforms, it's really easy. I can just right click and say, you know, build for this, which means that, ah, it's already built. Rebuild. It rebuilt for this, and you'll see that that's building, you know, all the shared sources here along with the platform specific code, and it builds me a Windows uh, static library. And if I go right here and I, you know, say rebuild here, you'll see that actually goes ahead and builds me a nice Android library. So that's one of the ways that you know we're basically saying you can share your cross-platform code easily. Now these static libraries then eventually get used in these these uh, these folders here. Uh, the image native activity uh, project here takes that static library and creates a SO file, which then eventually gets consumed in APK right here. And likewise for Windows, the .a library gets you know, consumed in this media capture app, which is basically a Windows UAP app and so on. So that's playing like, you know, so what you can see here, the beauty of this solution is that you can actually build two apps from one solution, target both Android and Windows. Is there any questions here on how sh sh code is being shared and that kind of stuff? That, that Windows is all Windows, right? Windows, all Windows 10? Yeah, all Windows 10, all the platforms so that are there. Or desktop or anything. You could also add Windows 8.1 and Windows 8 and, and all that kind of story there. So, yes, sir. Uh, actually, I'll give him a chance first. He hasn't asked a question yet. Oh, because uh, we're hoping that you don't have to use two IDs. And if you take a look at our scenario, uh, what we're really going after is that if you have a lot of C++ code that's being shared, you don't want to maintain like multiple solution files and multiple, multiple you know, different solutions and all that. You want to be able to just do that from one solution, set the Windows project as a starter project, uh, be able to run the application. Same story for Android, same story for iOS. Uh, now, if that doesn't actually appeal to you, we would love to talk to you to understand why is that the case. <laughs> Yeah, so right now, I mean, you know, we pretty much are there for Android, uh, and we'll be, we'll be launching all that in a couple of months. For iOS, uh, we're working on that as well. We do have some of the support for language servers and debugging for Objective-C as well, but we don't have the full support for the interface builder or storyboarding yet. So we have a story for that where we allow you to kind of like, we also, when we build for iOS, and you'll see that, we create a PBX project file or an Xcode project that you can go and Xcode and open up there. Do all your UI work and then come back to Visual Studio and keep doing that as much as you want and it will work for you. So that's a current story, but we're definitely hoping to move in terms of that model as the use cases and the usage of our product increases. Yeah. You're talking, uh, for the Java stuff, you're talking maybe a couple of months. And as I said, if you share your email or your contact information with me, I will make sure you're one of the early adopters for that. So I'm going to keep going because we have a few demos here. So, so next thing I'm going to uh, show you guys is that I want to show you some of the language service experience. Someone actually asked me a question on why is this useful. So the other thing that's useful here is let's pick up this guy. This slide looks very interesting. And I'm going to add a bunch of code here. It might not make any sense right now, but it will soon. Okay, so now if you see, I just added some, some source here. You will see two colors here for squiggles. Does anybody see two colors first of all? There's only one person who sees two colors. There should be more. Perfect, okay. <laughs> all right. Now, now that you guys see different colors, does anybody know what these different colors mean here? So what, I'm, what I've just done is that I've taken a shared source file, which is being shared between the Android and the Windows platform, and I've added some, some bunch of code here. Now the piece of code here is Windows specific, and some, some, piece, of, some piece of code here is Android specific. So what the colors are really indicating is, anyone? One is that, that it's not cross-platform because this is designed for being cross-platform. I'm guessing the purple might be that it's Android specific, whereas the red might be only Windows specific. Perfect, or? yes, that's, that's right. I mean, the colors are mixed, but other than that, you're right. Uh, if you take a look here, the squiggle here in this case uh, on the Android log print message is the Windows IntelliSense or the UAP stuff actually mentioning that. I do not know what this Android log print API is because this is, a window, this is an Android specific API. So the Windows IntelliSense actually is telling you at design time that if you build this code for Android, it will build, but if you build this for Windows, it will not build. 
Same way, the underscore underscore M128X and Y here is basically the language extensions that Microsoft added for intrinsics, and these are Windows specific only. And likewise here, uh, you know, these are not going to build for the Android platform, so the Android Intelligence is lighting that up and saying that, you know what, this is not something that's going to build for Android. So what you can really do by this, uh, the other advantage of this experience of working in the shared source is that at design time we tell you that this piece of code is going to build for all your platforms or build for one of those platforms or not build for none of these platforms. So you can actually kind of like save some time here by, by, by being able to use this kind of a solution. Can you, can you actually do it so that instead of, uh, let's say that you wanted to have the same X, Y intrinsics, but have it defined for Android? Yeah, you could just if def that, uh, you know, you just uh, if def that and then. But does, does it allow you to do auto if def uh, so that you keep, you're using the intrinsics so each of those. We don't do that right. We don't do auto right now, but you can just do what I just did. So okay. if you look at the UAP now, it's going to activate. It didn't. So I think it's like this. I hope. So now if you'll see for UAP, it will activate. For Android, it will actually deactivate. Okay. Right. There's another question here somewhere. I, I missed a hand. It's okay. I'm going to keep going. So that's the second demo that I had. I was going to show you the app running and all, but we don't have time for that. So I'm going to go to the third demo, which is going to demo another app here which is uh, both Android, Windows, and iOS. So uh, people are here have tried out our story for Android and Windows, but so this is a template that I just installed. You can find this on the web. It's basically a blog that we published on VC blog. What, what this does is that it allows you to build uh, an app both for Android, iOS, and Windows. And it's basically OpenGL code across the board for these three platforms. And you can share it, you can build it from one solution, and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm just going to create one here. Actually, even better, I'm just going to reuse the existing one. Oh, actually, I created one. Perfect. No, I don't want to use TFS or any of that stuff here. So let me actually uh, let me actually just mention what this what this uh, app is doing now. So so far, I've shown you an Android app, an Android Windows app. Now I'm actually going to show you an Android Windows and an iOS application. So and again, it's the same solution here. So like I mentioned in the last tab, there's a library there which is getting built. Likewise, in this case, you have this simple render.cvp, which has uh, all the OpenGL code that you have. Uh, you know, and this, this is being shared by particular references. This is be, you know, the, the Android stuff references the shared code, the iOS stuff references the shared code, and uh, the Windows stuff also references the same piece of shared code. How, so. how come it's giving the purple? Uh Lines. I'll get into that in a second. I'm very happy you brought this up though. So before I go there, I just want to mention like someone actually asked a question on like, you know, for the iOS app to be published on the store, you need to be able to build it on the Mac. So what really is happening here is that we actually have a remote agent that runs on the Mac and it basically listens for requests. We, we use it for building, we use it for debugging, we also use it for querying information like what kind of provisioning profiles you have configured in Xcode, what kind of uh, debug targets are available, uh, you know, in terms of devices connected to the Mac and all that kind of stuff. So that, that particular piece of software is running on my Mac here. I don't have enough leg room here to show you guys that. So if you're running Parallels, you could do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with Parallels, it's, it's really easy. You just basically set it up, and, and you can just kind of like use the same machine for, for doing that. I'm sorry? I think... I think you could have, I don't know the answer to the question, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I think, I think we should be able to have multiple debugging sessions, but I'm not sure uh, about that. So the way you guys do it is you basically come to the tool options window, and you basically, all you need to do is set up your IP for where the Mac is. So you use this menu, uh, and you can just kind of like set the host name. This is basically the host name for the Mac, and this is the port number. And I've already paired there before. And I'm going to pair this again just to make sure my Mac is leading and alive. And, and that's pretty much it. And then we'll take care of basically being able to take this piece of source code, build it on the Mac, using the Clang LVM tool on the Mac. And as, 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 a, um, as a get out of jail card, we also, allow you, we also build an Xcode project for you guys. So you can actually, you know, when, you, when you're about to deploy this app to the iOS App Store, and you want to, let's say, use an iOS X, Xcode instrument, or you want to do something in Xcode for that, you can actually bring up the Xcode prod and work there. And then we're working on experience right now to take that project from Xcode and back into VS and keep doing that as much, as much as you guys want. So that's our current experience right now. 
since I've already shown you uh, some of the iOS and so uh, iOS, uh, Android, and Windows experience, I want to show you the iOS experience. But before that, I want to answer this question right now. So right now, the errors that you're seeing here are all iOS specific. And the reason for that is because I haven't set up the right IntelliSense path on purpose. So once I actually set up the right IntelliSense path for this, automatically these kind of like errors will go away. So right now this app will build, but the IntelliSense experience is not lighting up because I haven't set the right headers, which are basically on the Mac side. Is there any questions here on what I just said about how the iOS experience works or something like that? No? Okay, so basically you're saying that the squiggles are because of the yeah. iOS stuff, which, which are iOS specific head. Right, and uh, these are all iOS specific errors, and all, all we really need to do is set up the right uh, headers for that, and these will go away. And I actually wanted to point that out uh, on purpose here, because uh, we want to show up the iOS experience here right now. So next, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm actually going to get into my library project here. Actually, no, what I want to do is, what do I want to do? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to set up my iOS application here as my startup project. You could also do that from the debugger dropdown. And I'm actually going to hit uh, rebuild. So rebuilding this uh, will actually cause the, uh, oops, there we go. So that's actually, you can see the build happening here. And the build is actually happening right here uh, on my Mac right here. And what I can do here, so that's the, that's the remote agent running and the build is happening here. And something really bad happened. Let's try this again. Sometimes it works better with the, uh, just give me one second. I'm just going to restart my agent here. Okay, just give me one second, sorry. Is there any questions here so far? Can you, uh, instead of having like a Mac laptop, could you actually have like a Mac build server, um, like, you know, a small set of uh, Mac, uh, Mac machine? Uh, so that way it can, can run in the background and do the development on Windows uh, Windows 10. Uh, have that be a, like a, just only a build server, no GUI, no user interface. Um, you can do that. Uh, if you can set that up, you can absolutely do that. Uh, okay, so let's try this again. Let's see if this works. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to... Just give me a second. I need to kill my Mac. Uh, uh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not killing my Mac. I'm just uh, killing my... So let's do this. There's about five minutes left. Is there any questions? I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, I'm going to just uh, restart this. Can you do it? Uh, can you show it on Windows Universal application for right now? or? Yeah, you can show it in the Android application right here. Um, it's, it's really easy. I can actually just show you in the Mac in a second. Um, the network connectivity here is bad, so I was pairing it on my phone, and my phone, I believe, has died. But we'll talk about that later. So, uh, yes, sir, at the back of the room. Right. Right. Um, how does this keep pace with the native platform? Oh, because uh, we actually don't, uh, we're not in the business of making an SDK or any of that kind of stuff. So what we really do is that we, we basically rely on Apple and Android. And as soon as they update, like, provide a new API level or they provide a different tool chain, we just kind of like leverage that. We don't actually, you know, in case of Xamarin, they have their own SDK. In case of Marble, they have their own SDK. And you know, as new APIs become available, they actually have to go and make sure that that API is available via the Marmalade SDK or the uh, or the Xamarin SDK. We don't do any of that. We basically just rely on the basic SDKs that Android and Google provide, Android and iOS provide. So is it correct then to say that the day that the API changes for say Android, we, I can on that same day use that whatever the new API levels are in this? Yeah, in, in most and cases, yeah. With the, yeah, in most cases, it should just happen. And the other thing that I should mention here is that uh, we have the notification manager here. So if you take a look at the right here, this is a new thing in Visual Studio. Who's actually seen this menu? Perfect. So what you can do is that if there is, let's say, a bug or something that comes up, that let's say there's a breaking change that Android actually released. Let's say they changed location for a tool like AAPT or something, and now the Android build is not working. 
we can actually pretty much shoot a live update. Uh, and then, you know, customers can just kind of like install it the same day as soon as it's available, and then they're very well on the way uh, for, from, from that perspective. Does that make sense? So you're saying if there's a bug, then you can install the update as soon as the update is there? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. If there's a, sometimes they actually do, uh, you know, go ahead and actually introduce breaking changes. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, you can actually just use that mechanism, and we will, we will take care of that. We're pretty, we're pretty vigilant on being able to update this pretty uh, live and so on. So for some of our bigger customers, I can't mention them because of privacy reasons, but we've actually done you know, feature updates and all that kind of stuff as well, just so that they can actually build stuff. Is there any questions there while I still, yes sir, at the back of the room? Any one of you guys first? So sorry, I didn't actually get your question. Do you have automatic generation of uh, interfaces for mm -hmm. iOS, for Plastic C, mm -hmm. for Java and I? Now, is there anyone from Dropbox here in this talk? I believe you can answer that question better. Uh, I'm giving a talk tomorrow. Uh, an open source tool, a tool that'll do that for you. So there is actually, I think it's called Genie, or I think it's, I believe it's called Genie. And there's, there's basically these guys who are kind of like leading the work there uh, on that front. And I believe our Facebook friends are also making up something in the, in the background. So there's definitely techniques that are there. Now, if you're just talking about, you know, using, creating GNI headers and such, uh, we don't actually have like support for Swig or, you know, Java Edge or any of that. But what we've seen is that it's fairly easy for people to do that and no one's really complained about that yet. But if that's really a, a big use case for you, we should definitely talk. Could it be possible that it just doesn't have the definitions for the the iOS files? Or no, I think uh, it's just the the network is not being uh, the the network gods are not being very friendly to this sadly. So um, we just tried this out before we came here. Uh, but yeah, is there any other questions here? Yes, sir. Uh, Cocoa Pods for iOS. Uh, yes, people have asked for that, uh, and we haven't worked on that yet. But uh, if that is really a use case for you, Cocoa Pods is cool. So it would be nice if, if, if it wasn't prevented. I see. Especially if it's open source code. Right. We'll we'll take that feedback. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, we do have support for Apache Cordova in Visual Studio. Are you aware of that? Um, no. Okay, so we do have uh, support for Apache Cordova. If you're able to send me your email or share that with me, I will be happy to provide you the documentation and the, and the right guides for it. What about, what about including um, like the scripted bootcamp to generate, generate as a, possibly in the future web assembly? I am I'm very illiterate in, uh, in Apache Cordova, but I will find the right guys for that. Uh, I, I don't have the answer to that question, I'm so sorry. Um, is there any questions there other than that? I'll actually... Some people in VC are looking at Inscription. Okay. Uh, it's really early. Uh, right now we've got partners, uh, external companies that are interested in getting advice from us and we're going to let them lead the way a bit because it's going three or four different directions. We want to see some stability before we impose. Just very, very quickly, uh, if you are a Xamarin user, we also have an experience for Xamarin C++. So you can actually go to C++ library, uh, Android library, and leverage that in Xamarin app, and you can all do that in Visual Studio. If you just follow the slide deck, it actually has links for that. And then just the last slide here is what's coming. So you'll see here, uh, we're working on Java language support. Uh, we actually have uh, created CMake converters automatically for our Android Visual Studio and iOS Visual Studio story. Eon, are you here somewhere in the crowd? I can't see you. But yeah, so he's at the back, so you, you can talk to Eon there. He's actually been working on this pretty heavily. And we also are working on, you know, creating project importers for Android Studio and Xcode. And we're pretty much there for that. We already have platform targeting for ARM64, x64, and all that kind of stuff. And the last thing here is the resources. If you guys are looking for more information about what we mentioned here, this used to work. Resources. All right, here we go. Thank you.
So this is the vs.com page. So there's basically a forum here where you can follow to ask us questions. And we're very happy someone actually asked us a question. So we try our best to answer that. So is VC blog. That's my email and that's Mark's email, uh, I believe. And we'll be very happy to answer questions for you guys. I'm very, very sorry the IS table did not work, but it does work. You guys try it out. Uh, um, and <laughs> take my word for it. I have I have very unbiased uh, opinion on that, uh, obviously. So please try that out. And I'm very happy you guys came here to this talk. And I'll be around here to answer questions. And so will I believe Mark. So thank you very much again for attending this.